Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, the uh, casual Friday edition. And I'm going to let you guys know right now, this is the edition that we're only going to do three takes on. We're not doing two, like I promised, or, f or one, like I started with half an hour ago. We're only doing three takes. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, to say, and it's still December 1st. 2017. George, often we start with the weather report and it's 50, partly cloudy here in Connecticut, which is about 15 degrees above normal. And uh, it's kind of amazing. We finally have some enjoyable global warming. What's it like down in Florida? Well, it's very cold. It gets down to the high 50s at night. And mm -hmm. so we have to get our woolly quilts and comforters out and when I come to work I have to wear a tweed coat because it's only in the 60s it's probably in the high 70s low 80s right now and that's what it'll stay the rest of the day then it'll start freezing again at night so we're we're quite cold right now well we, we started our pre-show and I kept seeing your hair twitter back and forth with uh some wind in your your room there you get the fan running well yet yeah, um We've grown so rapidly that we have to use my office on Sunday as one of the Sunday schools. And we have the Sunday school for the kids who have reached the stage of life that they I have to lock my desk and I've got to lock the closets. And they've now started playing with the thermostat of the AC on the wall. And somehow or another, they busted it. And I'm waiting for our uh, sexton to come around to fix it. So I've got little circulating fans in the office to keep me alive. <laughs> That's good. All right. Uh, what we need from our audience. Uh, every week I ask you guys to donate something. Normally I say donate likes. If you go to the Facebook page, donate a like there. If you go to our YouTube page, donate there. We have different fiscal needs coming up because 2018 is around the corner and there's some big trips George and I need to take. First, we're going to go to GAFCON and we'll probably take three of us, Gavin, George, and myself. And then uh, we were all talking and we said, George, came, hey, George says, we should send Gavin to Rome. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, oh, no, no, not like that way. This is a, uh, a great uh, pro-life event they have going on there. And uh, we, we should send Gavin there to be a reporter. And I said, all right, we'll do that. But we need to raise money for it. And then the Episcopal Church is having another one of their get-togethers called General Convention in Austin, Texas. And I'm going to send victim George Conger to be a reporter there. And that should be fun. Now, how this works. I know I'm asking for money here in December. I really want you guys to give after January 1st because I've raised as much as I really can for uh, 2017. Any other income would probably force me to move up to the 990 long form. And I've been filling up the 990EZ since day one because we often collect less than $25,000. Kevin, people are more than welcome if they want for tax purposes to give this year yeah. to give to me. Yeah, that's right. Uh, my sure. rector's discretionary fund, and the <laughs> money will just be resting, resting there until it's called to spring forth. <laughs> so, folks, if you've got, if you have tax problems this year, yes, send it to the rector's discretionary fund at Shepherd of the Hills Episcopal Church, and I'll get new white wall tires for the Cadillac. I certainly will do good things with it. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking $100,000, I'm willing to pay to have somebody fill out the long form for us. That's about 2 k So, you know, but <clears throat> in 10 years of uh, raising money, I've never raised that much money, George. But, yeah, it's small talk. Well, we, we, our Kevin, demographic, we, well, hold on. We know our demographic is a 55-year-old uh, about to hit pension clergyman. So you're not going to get a lot of money. Yes, but every time we've asked, we've received. Yes, every, absolutely. In other words... We, we, we don't ask, uh, we don't harp on money, uh, neither of us draw any income from this. And we when we ask to do special things like going to GAFCON, which we did in five years ago, yeah. or to the ACC in Jamaica, or uh, recent uh, Kevin's trips to England, it's all been covered. Mm -hmm. Not only by Mrs. Carlson, but by her viewers. <laughs> no, I mean, the reality is we've never not, we've never missed an event we wanted to go to. And that's all because of your gracious giving. Um, and I was thinking, how could I really sell this? And we just had Cyber Monday. And we had Giving Tuesday. 
and this is Friday. This is called uh, Stock the uh, Reserves of Anglican TV Friday uh, by giving, getting rid of your guilt. If you bought somebody a present on Cyber Tuesday, you're clear. This isn't about you. This is for the people who went online and bought themselves something because it was on sale. We want matching funds. It may be hard because you bought the new TV. Um, and I understand that it's, it could be hard, but uh, you give us matching funds for any self purchases on, on Cyber Tuesday. I think we'll be good for the year, George. And also, folks, we need to heat Gavin's studio. That's right. <laughs> we really do. Uh, he is you know, freezing. there was. There, no, I mean, they're like. It wasn't the lighting, but there was breath coming out. There's steam coming out with his breath because of the cold there. And <laughs> folks, it's not healthy for him to be in the sub, in in a meat locker to video. Hey, I'm watching, and it's like little little Tim from uh, the Christmas Carol. You know, I need more coal. I'm freezing. I'm like, oh boy, we need to help Gavin too. So if you could uh, yeah, go to Anglican dot forward slash donate, there's three or four different ways to uh, send money our way. Um, and we don't care about the amount. Obviously, uh, five dollars is as uh, healthy to us as a thousand, and we really appreciate uh, all those who give. You've supported us now for uh, this is our tenth year anniversary, and uh, thanks, guys. We do appreciate it. George, we need to move on to the news. This is the third try we're going to do with Toronto, Trump, and Zimbabwe. First, we're going to talk about a, a really wonderful diocese that has declared that it is the model for the Anglican Communion. Kevin, far away in the magical north, there's a place where joy and happiness, peace reigns, where all Anglicans live in love and charity with their neighbor, and everything is just wonderful. Of course, it's Toronto. Oh, I thought you were going to say which us. Is a not, which, oh, well, <laughs> its bishop, Colin Johnson, has announced that Toronto is a model for Anglicanism everywhere. Follow the yellow brick no road. No worries, folks. <laughs> Look at Toronto. Well, Come to the light. <laughs> Come to the light. When your policy is to kick out the conservatives, uh, to depose those who uh, you know, want to stay biblical and orthodox, by golly, at, at some point or another, there's not going to be any uh, people uh, causing trouble, and you're going to be very happy. Kevin, I reminded, uh, I studied Russia and the Soviet Union in college, and mm -hmm. I spent a great deal of time looking at old uh, papers and reports from, uh, like, you know, the, the, the 13th Party Conference where everybody claps in unison, and the chairman, general secretary, gets 99.9% .9 of the votes. And, of course, if you're the man at the top of an organization like that, you think it is all wonderful, because mm -hmm. everybody That's right. claps in unison. <laughs> which is very creepy well it is because and i tell you what toronto could be one of those places because of the temperature climate that could have their own gulags is the bishop a fool or what does he say well the bishop basically said that our way of handling the divisions over human sexuality in toronto is the model for everybody else we're not fighting anymore now you have to ask yourself why not could it be that the conservatives have been forced out and they've all joined ANIC? Could it be that your that eighty percent of the congregations are on life support, so the whole gay issues are of no consequence whatsoever? When the vestry meets, they're trying to figure out how to pay for the heating. Mm -hmm. Could it be that you've got a few evangelical conservative parishes that basically have walled themselves off and basically saying the rest of you can go do your thing? We're happy here, like St. Paul Bloor Street in Toronto. It's, it's fantastical, it's farcical to think that Toronto would, and the Anglican Church in Canada would hold itself out as anything other than an object of pity. Um, the National Church in Canada doesn't release statistics. It hasn't for going on two decades now, so we don't know how it's doing. Individual bishops from time to time will give speeches and church leaders that they have looked at the internal statistics and will tell us. Dean of Toronto uh, had a recent speech where he said that 80% of the churches are not functioning, uh, aren't making their own way, that they need support. The Bishop of Quebec saying, you know, the majority of our members now belong to First Nations tribes in the Arctic Circle because the regular parishioners in uh, Quebec City and in the, that part of Canada have all left. But we can't get any hard and fast numbers. Yet the bishop is more than happy to say, well, things are wonderful. Look at us. Well, we also see that here in the Episcopal Church. The, 
you know, Michael Curry is saying, you know, things are a little more peaceful than I than I'm around. And, you know, you had a run on conservatives. They've all left and went to the ACNA. Uh, I would certainly say Justin Welby's feeling a little bit more comfortable in his position in the Church of England now that uh, uh, some of his conservative clergy are starting to flee. Um, if you just kick everybody out, of course, it's going to be comfortable and uh, happy, clappy places in Oz for you. Now, Jake Worley was not in the Diocese of Toronto, and no. so I'm sort of connecting two different things. He was over in Caledonia and British Columbia, which is a northwestern uh, bit of that the vast province. Jake Worley was officially refused uh, confirmation as bishop because he held principles and teachings contrary to the Anglican Church of Canada's official doctrine and discipline. And to wit, he had once been in the AMIA and had crossed borders, having had an AMIA congregation that was in the same geographical jurisdiction as the Diocese of the Rio Grande. One of the suffragan bishops of Toronto is a partnered gay man. And the Diocese of Toronto, for a while, has had gay marriages and gay blessings and is out in the forefront. They are all been the gay pride marches and all this and that. And still, Canada has not officially, officially gone all in. And so that's why Fred Hiltz doesn't get hammered at the primates meeting, because he hems and haws and said, well, we may be doing this, but that's of individual dioceses. So Jake Worley can be canned for not adhering to the principles of Anglicanism, while other bishops are promoted and honored and celebrated for not adhering to the principles <laughs> of Anglicanism. There's a, and I'm, I apologize to our Canadian viewers, but there's a certain strain of Canadian liberal intellectual elite that despises the United States and despises uh, conservatives in his own country and is, such a, is so good at hypocrisy the rules are different for me not you peasants in the countryside we see that too in the united states but in canada they're a little bit farther down that road of the governed and the governors yeah all right this is where we we always trip up this is our third recording and we, we transitioned into talking about justin welby's baffled comments on trump and we uh, stumble here because George and I are pretty much apolitical. Whatever Trump does, whatever, you know, it's not a big deal. As long as he's, you know, keeping the country together, protecting the borders, doing what presidents are supposed to do. And we, tr when we talk about the minutia of Trump, you know, we, we start to go down rabbit trails. Look at the press out there in the real world. They can't, they can't say one straight thing about Trump without going down a rabbit trail. Well, he almost killed someone, you know, or whatever. And so this is where we have had three recordings because of transitioning to Trump. So I've laid that bare so you guys know that we're not going for. If we if we stumble here, you're going to be listening to the stumbles. Um, last week, or uh, 10 days ago, seven days ago, Justin Welby sat down with the BBC and was doing a wonderful interview. If you watched my uh, talk two days ago with Gavin, we talked a little bit about that to get the English perspective. And he was asked, what do you think of the economy? What do you think of this and that, Brexit? And finally, as the, we're, we're concluding, he goes, well, what do you think of Trump? That's a loaded question. You ask me what I think of Trump, and I'd give you a good half hour answer. Um, George the same because there's Trump the man Trump the president and so when you ask that question um, you're gonna get rabbit trails and craziness because you know to be honest Trump should not make you comfortable but what he's doing as a president is beneficial to the American uh, economy and country so far even though there's uh, much fear amongst the liberals so that's where George and I, you know, kind of get in the minutia. George, let me st set this straight. What do you think about Justin Welby's comments? Please tell me his comment and then uh, what you think about it. Justin Welby said he was baffled why American fundamentalists and evangelicals would support Donald Trump. He just couldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. it made no sense to him. And what do I think about that? I think Justin Welby's a twist. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, uh, I'm sure Justin Welby is a nice man, kind to his dog and his wife and his kids, but Justin Welby is really out of his depth as Archbishop of Canterbury. I come from a political mindset, and which is uh, that 
clergy should not get involved in the minutia of politics. That is for politicians. Clergy should preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and encourage their parishioners to live out the gospel imperative in ways that are appropriate and life-changing. When you get up and you start to say, vote for Fred Smith or vote against Proposition XYZ, you're abusing your authority as a minister or a priest because you're trying to... It's like these women clergy who go to abortion rallies and dressed in their Eucharistic vestments and say, God thinks that the abortion is a sacrament. Now, on one level, that's heretical, it's angering, but it's also pitiable because these women obviously don't understand who God is and what sacraments are. So I feel sorry for them. And I've reached the point with Justin Welby, I feel sorry for him because he, he is not a believer in the way that I understand. Believers. Well, if we go back He's a manager. to... Yeah, if we go back to the Gospels and go back to uh, following what Jesus did, Jesus seemed to be the most apolitical figure of the time, maybe in history. Every time he was uh, uh, tested by the Pharisees and the scribes about things political, he gave the most fabulous answers. Take taxation. Give on to Caesar. You, know, you can go all these little examples where the, the people today just want to know his politics. And I, he, he could avoid the loaded go, question. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole because we're not re-recording again. So this is my opportunity. <laughs> oh. I've, been, I've been teaching confirmation class uh, for, uh, we, we, we're doing pretty well in attendance and new people. And mm -hmm. most, almost everybody who's new doesn't, isn't from the Episcopal tradition. So I have to explain how Episcopalianism <laughs> works. So, so we've been doing a series of classes and one of the things I pointed out in the church history is that up until the Civil War the Episcopal Church had canons in place that forbade the clergy from getting involved in politics mm -hmm. and the reason why they did that was because they knew that they nobody was going to agree big issue was slavery you had you know some southern bishops Leonidas Polk Bishop of Louisiana when the war broke out took his collar off and became a general in the Confederate Army you sure you had some northern bishops who were abolitionists mm -hmm. who were and the church just said that, you know, we see we, there are men and women on both sides of these political issues who we think are profoundly wrong, yet we still see them as fellow Christians, and so we're just not going to talk about it. We'll let the people, the lay people, fight these battles out, but the church should be there to support, encourage, and educate the lay people. And where the only major denomination who had a major presence in the South and a major presence in the North to survive, because our choice was we're not going to talk about slavery till the war is over, and then once we figure out who's won, we'll go forward. Now, they, mm. that may not be the most heroic stance, but it's a stance that arose out of the English Civil War. Of you have people who are never going to agree, but we're all Christians, and let's find a way to work together in, harm in harmony without murdering each other. And you've got Donald Trump making remarks that disparage over half the United States um, that he cannot understand. He's basically saying these ignorant Christians, how could they support somebody who I and the other intellectual elites think is a, a, a joke? Well, that Trump didn't say that. Welby did. Welby, excuse me, yeah, I'm sorry. I must right. have misspoken. No, that's all right. If Welby is saying that, he obviously is not interested, as Gavin pointed out, in reconciliation. He's interested in demonizing people. There's a lot that I would not, I would say to my children and the young people, don't do this like Donald Trump. Uh, but there, are, but then at the same time, I can point to what he's been done in the U.S. economy and the government. Now, is it incumbent upon me or a min or anybody else who's got a piece of plastic around his neck to? get involved in the personal side? No. Well, and that's, that's where the big more. problem because when a person with a collar speaks, especially like a Justin Welby, uh, there's the assumption he's speaking for God and God doesn't like Trump. The fact that Justin Welby went after the American evangelical uh, is really what upsets me. Uh, you're th first of all, he didn't get into office because of the American evangelical. He got into office because the person he was running against had a 40-year uh, track record of corruption, lies, and and death, and it was a pretty easy win. Well, yeah. I mean, just 
how would all these tens of millions of Catholics who voted for Donald Trump now like to be known that they're really secret evangelical fundamentalists? Yeah. Well, or, or the blue collar workers, or the majority of people from Derry, Wisconsin. You know, the uh, you know, like there's this special election for the Senate going on in Alabama, and I'll go out in the limb and I'll say I think Roy Moore is going to win, and. I don't have any special insight for knowledge or anything. I'm not a political uh, pollster. But the same thing that I saw and happened with Donald Trump is I think it's going to happen with Roy Moore. The smart, the self-satisfied, the Donald Trumps and the Washington Posts are telling the people out in the countryside, this is how you're supposed to vote, and if you don't, you're stupid and ignorant. And so Roy Moore will probably win, not because people think he's innocent, not because they think he's the greatest human being who ever lived, but because they don't want to be told that they're stupid and that the alternative they have uh, is worse than Roy Moore. And I think this is where people like Bill Clinton and how he was treated by the press in Hollywood and all the liberals uh, with all his foes and in, in issues is helping Trump. Uh, people say, well, it wasn't a big deal when Clinton was doing what he was doing. Why are you so hard on Trump? Well, and Trump is also his worst enemy by being a tweeter. Uh, you know, you, it, it's all this minutia. Uh, I'm just most upset when Justin throws American uh, evangelicals under the bus. Uh, at Thanksgiving, my brother's a social worker, works mm -hmm. for the state of Alabama. So that's ultra, he, ultra liberal or Alabama liberal? Well, Carter... Uh, his job in the mobile office of the state, he's the guy because everybody else in the, is a woman in the office. When you have to go take away someone's children, he's the one they send. He, yes, that's hard. Because uh, he's a man and these people in the backwoods all have guns. Mm -hmm. That being said, and I'm a priest in a very, very conservative part of Florida. This part of Florida went about 75, 80% for Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, I may exaggerate, but it was it big. It was big. And what we sort of, about, we were talking about this and that, that we deal with regular people. Uh, our, my Episcopal Church is not a, a, con a congregation with Volvos and soccer moms and free cheese at the reception. It's a, we have wealthy people, but we're majority working class. We're a rural church. And there is a, and Carter, my brother in Alabama, is saying there is an undercurrent among working class people among regular people uh the vast majority of this country who see washington dc as almost a foreign occupying enemy who sees uh so when donald trump so when the archbishop of canterbury said these things it didn't surprise any of them because he is part of the enemy he is you know denigrating their they're them as being poor white trash and kevin there are a lot of poor white trash out there <laughs> yeah I, I and mean, see and traditionally the job of the the episcopal church now this is embarrassing to say the job of the episcopal church in the south had always been to protect the poor white trash from the uh rising mercantile and middle classes to you know the, the whole atticus finch type of right. uh, you know the southern elite had always have always been episcopalians but they've not but they've abandoned that role in many places to be part of the chattering classes mm -hmm. rather than taking care of their own communities okay we did the trump story 12 perfect rabbit holes to go down um and it's amazing because i didn't vote for the guy uh i i couldn't you know you know i got into the vote the polling booth i had my son there and you know ben's like i know who you're voting for well yeah i did the whole b ticket which is all republican but i didn't fill out the top because i'm I just going to do it for, for me at that time yeah it wasn't going to happen because uh i i was the type of evangelical who could not cross that line there are many others who could um but for me not having hillary elected was you know a benefit a lot of people uh, who I respect and still respect voted for him, and I have no trouble with that. They were able to uh, cross that line and, and uh, check that box. Awesome. You know, we get to be participants in history, and they are. George, we're at 20 what? Five minutes. 
Uh, it's time to go. Oh, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let's just say Robert Mugabe's gone. Life will now resume in Zimbabwe. Oh, it's the Christmas story. Thank you, George. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 349 of Anglican Unscripted. Thank you.